William Shakespeare gave a great summary of the human race that I will condense. How noble in reason, and in form and movement how like an angel, and in apprehension how like a god. Now if you know the context of Shakespeare's quote in the play, you know that he meant it ironically and sarcastically because the people in the play are a bunch of miserable wretches and none of them are remotely described by what he says about the human race. We need only look around to us. The world as it is, look in the mirror and wonder, are we all that noble? Are we all that godlike? But we are. The key phrase is apprehension. Apprehension is the key to being godlike. And in apprehension, how like a god we are. It's a fancy word. It's a word that, of course, I love as a nerd. But I love it because of everything that it speaks. We usually know the word comprehension, to understand something. To apprehend something is to be able to control it. If you're apprehended by the police, that means you're in the back of the squad car. If we're struck with apprehension, fear, as we usually translate it, it means that we are being seized by the moment or are seizing it. We're not daydreaming. We're not thinking of something else, something that has happened that has brought us to apprehension, full awareness of the moment and a desire to control it. So somehow it became equated with fear because there is a connection. Apprehension means looking at the world and understanding or at least understanding it enough to control it or parts of it. God creates everything in the universe. He is the ultimate apprehender. God knows all things, comprehends all things, and controls all things. Being made in his image, what makes us godlike is that desire to apprehend, to take the soil and draw a line around it and make a furrow and plant crops that will then grow. These are things done according to God's design, and yet we take that which God gave us, and like children playing with Legos, we figure out how to make amazing stuff. Not out of nothing, like God does, and not on a cosmic scale, like God does, but in little bits and pieces. For all of the effect of sin, our depravity and our evil and our wickedness and the, and the filth that we create, we're still people in the image of God that build skyscrapers, that built the Great Wall of China, that built spaceships to go into space. We may use the internet for horrific things, but it's a great tool. Like God, we have apprehended as much as we can in the world, as a pale reflection of his power, as offspring that are like him, to control this. But this is key because we ourselves are controlled. Apprehension, getting a hold of something, applies also to our life of faith. It's critically important. How are we apprehended by God? How do we apprehend faith? How do we take hold of a life of faith? How is it that God gets hold of us? All right, maybe that is overcomplicating it a bit. We'll put it this way. The reason that sacraments are created by God is so that we can apprehend faith. If we didn't believe in the sacraments, and sadly there are denominations that do not, there's a lingering question. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh who died on the cross for the sins of the world, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. How does that fact become your fact? How does that salvation get from him to you? How does his death on the cross get planted inside us? How can what he did 2,000 years ago be present right now? And the fancy word is apprehension. We may know the historical facts, comprehend that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. But until we have apprehended it, taken hold of it by faith, had it deposited inside of us, it has no effect. It really doesn't. The key way to how this enters us is the sacraments. For the finger of God literally reaches down from heaven to touch us, 
to reach inside, to write something new inside us, in our hearts and on our minds, to change who we are inside ourselves and in his view, before his face. In the presence of God, we become changed because of what Christ did, but also because of the way Christ gives that gift to us. He does it because he's still alive. He is risen. He's glorified. He is the high priest in heaven, as Hebrews mentions. And he gives us this indelible mark continually in our soul through baptism, through absolution, through the Lord's Supper. These ways that he touches us and we touch him. That there's this moment of cross over to the cross from 2,000 years ago. That he who died on the cross gives us the benefits and we receive the benefit. No less than becoming one flesh with him by consuming his body and blood and you are what you eat. It is, as Hebrew said, a propitiation, which is a sacrifice that is ongoing forever. His death on the cross was a sacrifice that happened then, but it is a propitiation concerning our sins because it is continually given to us the benefits of that cross over and over and over again continually for the rest of our life. This is how we apprehend him and he apprehends us. It is something deeper and more beyond just his reaching down and, and, and scooping us up. It's his making us something new and continually depositing this information and this faith and this substance into us that makes us truly alive unto eternal life. It is a oneness, being one with Jesus, being shoved in his ribbon side as Moses was in the ribbon rock, being covered by his blood in a way that is received and real and present and now, not simply the memory of something that happened long ago, but being reconnected to it across time and space again and again. And of course, that's what the presentation of our Lord is all about. In case you were wondering what in the world this had to do with a text. Every firstborn male under the Old Testament covenant was brought to the temple and presented to the Lord in this unique and special way. All of which was meant to intend to foreshadow the firstborn son, the only son of God, the one that would come. It was a act of faith to say this might be the child born of the Hebrew people, born of the line of Abraham. This could be the one, that constant waiting for the deliverer, the true deliverer from sin, death, and the devil. And you'd bring the child with that reminder, he's yours. He might be your son that is to come, but he's definitely your child in any event. He is yours. We are yours. And God reaching down to say, he is mine which is exactly what happens when the baby Jesus is taken, the boy Jesus is taken to the temple. He's taken to be presented to the Lord at 40 days old, ready to be presented as the firstborn son of his mother. And all of this fulfills every presentation of every male that came before is fulfilled by the coming of Jesus. And by his arrival at the temple, it now shows the transition that every presentation after will also be different. The same way his baptism was different than ours and gave power to what would be our baptism. The way that his flesh and blood is human, but without sin and will continue to be given to us. That continually ongoing atonement for the sins of the world. That we are gifted the ability to apprehend, to understand, confess, and believe that this is what these miracles are of baptism, absolution, and the Lord's Supper. To be able to continually revive that well of eternal life springing up and this body and blood continually giving us the food of eternal life. Again and again and again, the Lord brings us here, apprehends us, and presents us before himself. And by that, we receive the benefit of knowing, apprehending the faith that the world does not either comprehend or apprehend. We are given the ability to know, confess, to creedily say, we believe these things to be true, and in that moment be constantly being lifted up, regenerated, rejuvenated, re-enlivened, quickened is the old phrase, 
continually made new unto eternal life. It isn't just a historical fact, it's a daily fact of life. And particularly here at church, it is a fact continually in the water, in the word, and the body and blood received. In Jesus' name, amen.